Hey guys, thank you for checking out this episode. We'd love your support by heading to patreon.com forward slash freshly grounded. It really does make a difference in helping us continue making this content. And if not, no stress. Enjoy. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace. This month, we're raising money for the Spot Project. As you'll know, the Spot Project in Gambia is where Sam and I first met, and out of that, Freshly Grounded was born. Alhamdulillah. So it has, so it has a very close place in our hearts. This year, we're raising money for a health clinic where women can give birth safely. Currently, women in this village of Chamia often have to travel by donkey cart and ferry across the sea for hours to the nearest hospital to give birth. Imagine being nine months pregnant. Now, brothers, it's going to be hard to imagine, but sisters, okay, I'm not going, so basically, you're not, ah, oh, I've ruined it, okay, so imagine, nine months pregnant, either you, a family member, your wife, the, the last thing, the, or the first thing you want to do is provide them as much comfort as possible, you know, you need to rush to the hospital, and it's all systems go, and I imagine then, in all seriousness, them then having to like take a donkey cart to try and get a ferry. And and last week I told you guys of a story of this woman. She got the donkey cart to the ferry place. The ferry had gone, so she had to get a boat, and she ended up giving birth on the boat. Um, and that's uh, this health clinic changes that because they'll be able to give birth safely with professionals, and they'll get the right care. That sister, even though the baby was born fine, she's still dealing with post birth complications, and so um, that's why this. Uh, health clinic is needed it's also a multi-purpose center so it's going to be used for a few other things um but you guys can help by donating at spotproject.org forward slash freshly grounded that's spotproject.org forward slash freshly grounded we've also launched a special edition of our highly sought after game here we go we've also launched a special edition of our highly sought after game entitled the game the special edition, however, is a Ramadan edition. So it's entitled, you guessed it, The Game Ramadan Edition. And uh, it's a pack of 60 conversation cards to help you boost your Ramadan conversations with loved ones. But just don't take, but don't just take, man, I think this is only week two of me doing my intro by script and it's taking me time. So have patience with me, guys. But let's wheel it up and go again. Okay. <clears throat> We've also launched a special edition of our highly sought after game, The Game. And this one is a Ramadan edition. And it's a pack of 60 conversation cards to help you boost your Ramadan conversation with loved ones. But don't just take my word for it. In fact, take my word for it. Because editing other people's words is going to be too difficult and we're fasting. So take my word for it. The game is great. And it's highly sought after. And... Um, I don't know what that means. It's just something you say. It's highly sought after. Head over to shop.freshdegrounded.com. That's shop.freshdegrounded.com. Okay, this episode is with Usad Muhammad Tim Humble. We talk about the evil eye, its misconceptions, and how to protect yourself. It's a great episode. A great episode. Enjoy. And welcome to a Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast. Well, it's not exactly brand new anymore, is it? Welcome to Freshly Grounded, the p podcast. That's better. Created by best friends Faisal and Sam. Huh? I welcome. I said welcome to Freshly Grounded. After that bit. Created by. After that bit. Best friends Faisal and Sam. Really? Okay, so we are joined by Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble. Uh, may Allah preserve him and honor him. Jazakallah khair for joining us, Sheikh, today. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa jazakallahu khairan. How are you doing, Sheikh? It's really lovely fun. always to see you. Yeah, alhamdulillah, very, very well. And it's really nice to see you as well. Barakallahu fikum. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh, I, I, I'm conscious that um, I want to deep dive into a topic today that we haven't necessarily that we, we've actually spoken about numerous times on numerous episodes of Freshly Grounded with yourself, but I don't think we've ever like okay. done a big deep dive on it. And so, considering we're quite uh, going to be quite short on time with it, um, I'm like rearing to go. Uh, before we do, I do want to like break the ice slightly by uh, asking you one question. It wouldn't be Freshly Grounded if it wasn't uh, from our <laughs> new uh, Freshly Grounded Ramadan game. I don't think that's not okay. going to get further. Yeah, yeah, Just, yeah. I, I received a copy. Jazakallah. Oh, really? 
Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khair. Okay, so I'm just going to get one question off of you, get a bit of a reflection, and then we'll get started into the podcast. So the question okay. that we have is, I'll read it out. What lesson did you get from yesterday? So let's keep this Ramadan related. So think back to yesterday, last 24 hours. What lesson did you get from yesterday? Ooh, what lesson did I get from yesterday? Well, from yesterday, you know, I'm going to say what I really learned from yesterday is how much work it takes to maintain your memorization of the Quran. And that might sound like a strange one, but I was reflecting upon that in Taraweeh. Uh, the amount of, of effort it takes to to be able to keep the Quran memorized as it should be and to recite it as it should be without making any mistakes. Uh, really, it, the Quran needs more time than we give it. I think that's what I learned yesterday. The Quran needs a lot more time than we give it. Oh, yeah. You um, you always hear like uh, people asking about uh, that kind of stuff. And even something myself I struggle with a lot is like this idea of... Uh, I remember speaking to you actually about about the Quran and memorization and and about how like it's not sufficient to just like re- read something to your teacher that you're set for that week and then like move on. It's like something that like constantly has to be on your mind and stuff. And that conversation that you and I had it actually it really benefited me. Um, and I remember exactly what you said like to this day. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it resonates yeah, I mean, uh, even now. You know, you know, what I was thinking of right like the the people people of the past. They would typically, outside of Ramadan, outside of Ramadan, they would typically finish the Quran every 10 days. That was the norm. Some of them seven days, some of them three days. But the norm, like what was totally normal among regular Muslims in the past, was that people would finish the Quran every 10 days. Complete reading every 10 days, three times a month. And that's outside of Ramadan. Now imagine inside of Ramadan what, how people, what people used to read. And for us, you barely can find a person who finishes the Quran once a month. Uh, you can very rare you can find someone even who finishes it once or twice a month or regularly. In Ramadan, maybe a lot of people make an effort to finish it just once a month, and it just it requires so much more commitment than uh, than than what we give it. Subhanallah. Could you say that uh, uh, can, can can a person's sins stop them from picking up the mushaf? Yeah, no doubt. A person's sins can stop you stop you from all kinds of good deeds. Sins generally stop you from everything good. And a person can be prohibited. I mean, there are some narrations that a person said, I was prohibited from Qiyam al-Layl for a sin that I did 40 years ago or something close to that meaning. And a person could be prohibited from any kind of good, whether it's praying at night, whether it's reading the Mus'haf, whether it's memorizing and, you know, the famous uh, statement that uh, Al-Imam al-Shafi'i made to his teacher, Shakawtu li waqi'a su'a hifti. I complained to waqi'a of my poor memory. Fa'arshadani ila tark al-ma'asi. He told me to leave off sinning. And that's, you know, the, 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 our sins stop us from so much good. We don't, we don't appreciate the, the huge amount of good that misses us because of the sins we do. SubhanAllah. Uh, I, I, the, the the topic I wanted to speak to you about is 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 somewhat related. Um, I suppose it comes under like when we speak about the protection against um, this particular topic and stuff like that. But uh, okay, let's get started then. So the topic is the evil eye, uh, and I know it's something that we've kind of spoken about a few times in, on Fresh Uganda, as I mentioned. But I thought it would be nice for the, for like the next hour to just really just go over. Um, it, and some misconceptions and stuff like that um, uh, that could hopefully benefit myself and, and anyone listening. Um, so it's, it makes sense to start with like the evil eye. I, I suppose like we should understand to an extent like what it actually is or means. And then also, um, h- how do we know this is something that actually exists? Like how do we know from, from, from Quran or Sunnah that this is something that we should be wary of it exists and we shouldn't just like take it lightly, for example? Yeah, so uh, the fact that it exists, uh, there are numerous narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are some ayat of the Qur'an that indicate it. It's not mentioned explicitly in the Qur'an, where it mentions the evil eye, like that, Al-Ain. It's not mentioned explicitly in the Qur'an, but implicitly it's mentioned in the Qur'an. But where it's mentioned very clearly, is in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said al ayn haqq the evil eye is the truth the evil eye is something true 
And he even mentioned that if there was something that was to overtake the divine decree, it would be the evil eye. So something very, uh, very, very serious. In terms of what the evil eye is, there are different definitions for it. But uh, there is a definition that I have right here. It's a definition of uh, Al-Hafid ibn Hajar. Uh, when he talks about someone who looks at someone, and they look at someone or something with istihsan, and they think it's something, they look at someone or something in a way that this is something amazing or something that is really good. But the evil nature of their soul Effect causes an effect upon the person or the thing that they look at. The evil nature of their soul causes them to, the, the, the thing that they look at causes them to have an effect upon it. So that's one of the ways that we can, uh, we can understand the evil eye. Uh, there's a couple of definitions. As I said, Al-Habd ibn Hajar he said, it is looking at something with admiration blended with jealousy from the evil of a person's nature, ensuring, and that causing harm to the one who is looked at. And in another definition, it's said to be a poison which Allah puts in the eye of the one who gives the evil eye when they're amazed by something. And they speak of it without asking Allah to bless the thing that they're amazed with. So I personally like to just combine these two and say we've got looking at something with admiration or amazement, the evil of a person's nature, not asking Allah to bless the thing that is being looked at, and then finally causing that thing harm. And I think that's a really, really good general definition of uh, of the evil eye. Can, can a person admire or be in admiration of something without uh, the risk of causing evil eye? Yeah, I think that uh, the interesting thing, the first question people often ask is, is the evil eye the same thing as jealousy? Because we know, for example, Allah said in the Quran, وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ from the evil of the envier when they envy. So is that just the evil eye? You know, everyone knows the surah, surah al-falaq. Is that, is that just the evil eye? Or is there a difference between jealousy and amazement? Uh, there is a lot of discussion about it. There's a lot of discussion about it. But in reality, one thing I think that I've come to kind of say, and I feel this is pretty, you know, this is where the where where you can balance up all the different opinions is just to say that the evil eye has to come from the evil of a person's nature. Okay. Even if it comes from amazement, and some of the scholars they said it doesn't have to be jealousy, it can be amazement. It can just be so like for example, uh Ibn al Qayyim mentioned you can give the evil eye to yourself. And you can't really be jealous of yourself, right? <laughs> you can be amazed. Like you oh, this, you know just so amazed by something you see from yourself uh, that you can even give it to yourself, but it has to come from the evil of a person's nature. Uh, and so there are people who are jealous of others, who are amazed by things or admire things that they see from other people, and they don't cause any harm to those people. They actually, those, they, they don't cause any harm because the evil eye doesn't come from everybody. Not everybody has that tendency to give it. And not everybody is also affected by it. Depends on whether that person is protected or not. So yeah, there's a, a person could have uh, jealousy or amazement of someone else and not cause them harm. But there is that risk because there are people who have that uh, that tendency to give the evil eye, and that could happen from anyone when they have th those those three basic things that they are looking things looking at things with jealousy or you know, admiration, they're not invoking the blessings of Allah and ultimately that causes a harm upon the person that or the thing that's being looked at. So you mentioned about uh, not kind of praising it or praising Allah um, when, when admiring this thing. How, how would a person do that? How would a person be uh, admire something and then, and then is there something they can say or, or is it something that they say in their heart that can hopefully protect the person that they're admiring against the evil eye? Yeah, in the hadith of, uh, of Sahal ibn Hanif, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he indicated that a person in order to, uh, to stop the evil eye from happening to someone, that a person should invoke blessings 
they should invoke blessings for that person. Now, there's a lot of different discussion about how you do that, but this I'm, I, I like simple ways. So I'm just going to give a really simple one line, is that you say, Allahumma barik. Because the thing is with Arabic, then you're going to get into all the different variations of grammar and uh, you know how you say it for this thing and how you say it for that thing. But just to keep it super simple, there's one line you can say all the time. Just say, Allahumma barik. Oh Allah, put blessings in it for them. And I think before we talk about the blessings or while we talk about the blessings, for sure the person's heart, as you mentioned, some of the scholars, they said the minimum is that the person returns the blessing to Allah, meaning that they just recognize that the blessing is from Allah. You could say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, you know, that the blessing came from Allah. They recognize it came from Allah. But uh, the danger of just it being within the heart is the heart has an evil nature to it, right? The, the soul has that inclination and sometimes you might, you know, sort of internally be thinking, no, you know, like I want blessings for that person. And then, the, you know, the evil nature just takes over. And Ibn al-Qayyim, he has a really, really amazing statement. He said the origin of it is the amazement of the one who gives the evil eye with something. Then he follows it with the evil nature of his soul and it releases an arrow. So Ibn al-Qayyim describes it like an arrow that is shot from the heart of the person who has this amazement and, je and jealousy or this evil nature in their soul and it's like they shot an arrow at the person. Uh, and in the end of the quote, he actually says that it is exactly like an arrow to the point that he said that it is exactly like shooting real arrows. The one who one is shooting at the soul and the ruh and the other one is shooting at bodies and limbs. That's very the way it can happen internally it can take over a person very easily. And a person has that tendency to have an evil nature in their soul. So it's really important for them to verbalize and to say, you know, even if it's if Arabic is difficult, just to say, may Allah bless them in it. You know, so many times we see, in a culture of seeing, you know, people tend to, so we're like show off all the good things they have, right? Like social media, taking pictures, I'm enjoying myself, I'm having a good time. And people tend to sort of, even exaggerate the good things that are happening to them. And at that time, it's so important when you see something good from someone that you say, Allah bless them in it. And like I said in Arabic, short ten sentence, Allahumma barik. But before that, when we talk about the heart, there is something really important. And uh, when I learned about this, I thought it was, it was, I was, I thought it was really profound. And that is this idea that belief in Qadr, the divine decree, can save you from giving people the evil eye. And uh, the reason for that is, when you have proper belief in the divine decree, you become settled with what you've been given because you know that Allah decreed it for you personally. Allah chose for you what you have exactly, perfectly tailored for you. And Allah didn't give you what that other person has. And won't give you what that other, I mean, what they have at that time is for them and what you have is for you. So this idea that Allah has given each person the best thing for them and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed and whatever has happened to you is never going to miss you and whatever missed you is never going to happen to you. One of the benefits of it is that it reduces feelings of jealousy and it stops you kind of coveting what other people have and craving what other people have and it stops that craving for more that people have all the time. So I think that if we're talking about the heart, the most important thing you can have in your heart to stop giving people the evil eye is honesty to have proper belief in Allah's decree uh, in a comprehensive way, not just the belief that Allah decrees things, but trying to strive for that level of contentment where you feel happy and content with what Allah has given you because you know that Allah, who is the most merciful, has chosen for you certain things and he's chosen for you opportunities. And it's not that he's chosen for you um, that everything will always be amazing. You know, you'll always have the best life and you'll never have any problems or any difficulties because we know this life wasn't created for that reason. The one who created death and life to test you which of you is best indeed. So it's not that this life is meant to be this place of, you know, Jannah, like or, or everything's supposed to be amazing. But Allah has chosen for you the best opportunities for you personally and everything that is 
you know, that you've been given in your life is the best thing that could, the best set of opportunities, opportunities for Toba, opportunities for patience, opportunities for gratitude. And when you start to realize that and you realize the mercy of Allah upon you, it reduces your feeling of jealousy towards other people or that tendency to see what other people have in an evil way or a negative way. I think that's really important as well as what you say. Yeah, that, that actually perfectly transitions us into kind of the next part of the discussion, which is this idea of protection. And that's what I really wanted to delve into here, because I feel like there's not a huge um, issue necessarily amongst the Muslims in the varying cultures of accepting that evil eye exists, whether it's known as like Ayn, like you said, or Nazar in my culture, which I'm sure you've heard, uh, and, and stuff like that. So I don't think there's a huge uh, boundary with uh, with um, accepting that it exists however i think there's huge misconceptions into how to deal with it and also like seek its protection and so what i really wanted to delve into was um talking about the different ways that perhaps different cultures or or, or perhaps you and your experience um have seen uh, people um try and uh uh, kind of battle evil eye and seek protection from it ways that are like against the sunnah and then also kind of the correct ways because we know that the religion is so simple and um one of the clips that were, were that were put out recently on your instagram was uh you mentioning that the religion um it's not uh, made to be difficult upon us and um and then sometimes when we try and seek like things like protection from the evil eye, maybe we go around routes where we don't realize that we ha we do actually have a direct like uh, communication. We can like, we can, there, there's everything is like from the sunnah, we have a, a direct like link with Allah in that we can make dua directly to him. We don't need any uh, intercessors and stuff like that. Um, before we do go into the protections, it actually reminds me of a tweet that I put out uh, the other day or well, sometime back and it's uh it kind of it relates to the evil i've always had this thought and uh i'll read i'll read it to you so i said uh, where is it <laughs> it says i've always okay here it is I've always had the, and this is, this is true, this is something that's generally always been on my mind. So I wrote, I've always had this weird goal to one day buy a house that looks really ugly on the outside, but secretly it's my dream house on the inside. And I can't figure out if it's because I'm really unpretentious or if I'm just really scared of it being burgled and it looks nice outside. That's what I kind of like wrote. But I suppose what I really am saying is like, I don't know if it's because I'm like trying to um, protect myself from from evil and uh, from Ayn, uh, or if it's because like I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't know the reason behind it. It's just always been something in my head. Like I, I almost just want to like have uh, provide something great for my family and allow them to enjoy it. And that's something I'm striving towards. But I don't necessarily need uh, or, or long for perhaps uh, others to even see. And I don't, I'd almost prefer for them to think the opposite yeah. so that we're protected. Do you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I do. And I think it's a really interesting question because it leads us to a really interesting question on protection from the evil eye, uh, which is, is that something we should be striving to do, conceal the good things that happen to us? Because some people, they hear the statement of Allah, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ As for the blessings of your Lord, speak of them, you know? And they think, right, you know, like, Everything that's good, I need to flaunt it and show it. And, you know, I need to have everything I need to show. And and maybe, okay, from the non-Muslim side or the non-practicing side, yeah, people maybe do that from a love of the dunya. But even, even as, as Muslims, we have the idea that, you know, this is Allah's blessing upon me. Why shouldn't I, you know, show it to the world? Why is it a good idea to hide it? And I think like so many things in the evil eye, this is an issue of balance. That, they, that first of all, the ayah, it doesn't talk about the blessings of the dunya at all. The ayah doesn't, it doesn't have any connection to the blessings of the dunya. It actually talks about telling people about the religion of Islam and conveying the religion of Islam to other people. As for the blessings of your Lord, speak of them, meaning convey the religion of Islam to others. And it doesn't mean to speak of the blessings that you have in, in, in the dunya. So that's one side of things that we kind of got rid of a misconception that you don't have to necessarily uh, speak of everything good that Allah has given you. But I think it's a balance. I think that in so many things in the evil eye, and if there was one message that I would you know, sort of give out to everybody today, it would be 
to be in, in relation to the evil eye in the way you protect yourself, to be balanced. We made you a balanced ummah, not to be extreme on either side. So there is a side where people very, you know, everything good that happens to them, they feel the need to share it with everyone. And they want to sort of almost flaunt what they have and, you know, to show very obviously to everybody who looks the blessings that, that, that they've been given by Allah. And, you know, as a good Muslim, they want to bring that back to Allah. This is what Allah gave me. So maybe they have, you know, that really nice house from the outside and they have, you know, I don't know, they've written mashallah or something, but they have that, you know, that desire to say this is from Allah. But on that can go too far. And I think the basic rule should be if you can conceal something without haraj, without hardship on yourself, then you should conceal it. And that's if it doesn't bring hardship. But I don't think you should go to the other extreme, which is deliberately making something hard for yourself or bringing some difficulty upon yourself in order to conceal the blessings that you have. Because I don't really see that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to do that. There are some narrations. There are some narrations, one or two narrations with regard to children and things like that. But there's not like a, a, a wide body of narrations that tell us that everything good that used to happen to them, they used to conceal it to, a, to, an, you know, to the maximum extent. But I think that this idea that we automatically have to show everything good that happens to us, yeah, I think that that's also, I think it's somewhere in the middle. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a hardship upon myself uh, in order to protect myself from the evil eye. Like, I think there are better ways to protect yourself than that. I, for example, if I bought a house, I wouldn't go about like damaging the front of it in order to like, so that people don't think it's a nice house inside. But also, you know, when people ask you, and this happens to me, you know, a few times people ask me about this, that people will say to you, for example, let's say somebody bought a house and they got a really good deal. And then they start telling, you know, oh yeah, it was an amazing, and you know, I've never, I don't know how anyone could have bought a house so cheap. It was just, it just came to us like that, and it was such a blessing. And it, it does invite people to then feel jealous of you. Sure. So yeah. one of the most powerful things you can do is just to say, Alhamdulillah. You know, someone asks you, how is, you know, how is the new house? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, it's very good. First of all, Alhamdulillah is a word you can say in every situation, whether you're feeling good or bad, whether there are good things or bad things, because we say Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. We praise Allah for every single situation, whether it's something that is positive for us or something that feels negative for us, we praise Allah. And also it reminds the person to praise Allah as well. So the person you're talking to, when you say to somebody, you know, they say to you, you know, how is the new car? Alhamdulillah. They say, okay, now you've reminded that person that it came from Allah to praise Allah. You know, and sometimes I actually, I'll be honest, sometimes I actually will say to somebody, can you please say Allahumma barik? You know, like, if, especially when you see somebody has that habit. Even with my kids, I do that. If I see them say, oh, you know, you never, I saw somebody came with this brand, brand new car. It's this amazing new car and they brought it to the masjid. I'll say to them, say Allahumma barik. Even though that it doesn't come from their any sort of evil nature I mean young kids It doesn't come from the evil nature But it's a habit You have to bring people into saying You know you've got to Say Allah Mubarak Say Allah bless him in it. Or I will If I don't want to be so abrupt with someone I will say it myself Like I will say Allah Mubarak Allah bless him in it like, Someone comes And sometimes people come And they're like They tell you everything That's good that's happened to them. Oh you know today I just finished this contract And I, I made so much I say Alhamdulillah May Allah bless you in it and then the person like sort of stops and realizes, okay, you know, alhamdulillah, like don't, you don't need to conceal the blessings to the extent that you, you know, damage your things and you, you know, present things in another way to what they are. But also you don't need to tell everybody about every single good thing that happens to you. Otherwise it's like, stand, I mean, if Ibn Qayyim described it like, like being shot at, it's like somebody who was inside of a bunker. And they were like protected from those arrows or the bullets that were going over their head. And there's somebody who just stands on top and waves their arms and says, you know, like, shoot me, shoot me. So I just think that, you know, you, you should be in the middle, in the, somewhere, neither on either, not on either extreme. So, so let's talk about that then, the, the, the protection here. Um, before we go into the misconceptions, 
Um, how can a person proactively protect himself from UI? I know we've kind of de delved into it with with like con uh, concealing what you can and stuff like that, but I know that there's proactive ways in the sunnah as well that we haven't necessarily spoken about yet. So what what can somebody do to protect themselves uh, before we speak about you know things like the necklaces and, and stuff like that? So one of the things I think that people don't understand about protection or one of the most common misconceptions people have is that they look at only one way of protecting themselves and they kind of stick to that. Even if, I mean, that way could be wrong, as in it could be, you know, we talk about amulets and things like it could be, could be forbidden way, but it could also be a way that is permissible, but the person isn't, doesn't see protection in a complete way. They're only looking at it in a very narrow way. So for example, a person says, well, you know, when I leave the house, I say my dua, my dhikr for leaving the house. That's amazing. That's permissible. That's from the sunnah. And that will protect you from the evil eye, inshallah. But we need to see it as, we need to sort of zoom out, step back, and see it from a much more uh, comprehensive angle. And you, you know, it's, uh, that's, sorry, yeah, it's, that's what I think. No, no, sorry, it's about you instead. I, 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 it reminds me of something that you told me once again, and it just, I just, it just stuck with me to this day. And it was that you said about uh, two things you mentioned about Athkar, which is kind of what I'm alluding to here to, to end up speaking about Athkar. But two things you mentioned to me about them was one that it's like a layered thing in the sense that like the the, the better your Athkar is, the more concentrated it, you, you, you it, and and the better quality it is, kind of like the more protection. But the other thing was exactly what you were speaking about, mentioning that like for example. If you were to, if a person was to do their adhkar and then they to, they go to a haram place, you know the two, uh, you're kind of like protecting yourself, but then you're kind of opening yourself up, right? Yeah, definitely. You're what you're basically doing is, it, this is where the the scholars they talk about doing the, the adhkar with your limbs, and you start thinking, well, what does it mean? Like you know, dhikr should be with your heart and your tongue and your limbs, so your heart should be engaged. It shouldn't be like you're just the words are just you know. Uh, the words are going on your tongue, but the heart is completely disconnected from what you're saying. And that's one thing. On the other side, they talk about the limbs, and you think, well, apart from moving my tongue, what do I? What else do I need to do? But basically, you need to act in a way that is consistent with the dhikr that you made. So you asked Allah for His protection. You need to act in a way that is consistent with that request that you made to Allah. So when you left the house, you said, Bismillah, tawakkaltu ala Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. In the name of Allah, I put my trust in Allah, and there is no ability to change anything. And there is no power to do anything except with the help of Allah. And that dua is extremely powerful. When you say that, uh, it is said that you are guided, and you are protected, and you are sufficed against everything. And the shaitan despairs of you and says, how can I harm someone who has been guided and who has been protected and who has been sufficed against everything? But then a person who has said, I put my trust in Allah and I ask Allah for his protection. And then they went to a place that they know it, it brings the anger of Allah upon them. And that's like a person whose limbs are not they're not doing what their tongue is saying Their tongue is saying one thing And their hands and legs are doing something completely different So it is important that a person Doesn't remove the protection of Allah From themselves By acting in a way That's not consistent with what they've asked Allah for It's like asking Allah for knowledge Right? My Lord give me knowledge And then the person doesn't make any effort To study, doesn't make any effort To, uh, to learn anything then the person's dua, it's like an empty dua, you know, it's like the tongue is moving, but, you know, the person, if they wanted that thing that they were asking Allah for, they have to act in a way that is consistent with what they're asking Allah for. So that's on the topic of adkar, that's really important. But let me step back a little bit on the topic of before adkar. Two things that people rarely think about in terms of protection is, first of all, having the right belief in Allah. In a very general sense. And the second, following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And really everything we're going to say about protection really comes back to these two. But the value of having the right belief in Allah. Allah said, Allah said, those who believe and they don't mix up their belief with polytheism. 
i.e. they don't make a partner with Allah, their belief is pure, their belief in Allah is right. It is they who will have safety or security and it is they who will be guided. Now, if you look at that, Allah promised safety and security generally in the dunya and the akhirah for the person whose belief is right in Allah. And I think your belief is the greatest protection you have. And it's also the greatest potential to drop your protection because a person could do every dhikr that is there and they could do every dua that, that is authentically reported in the sunnah. But if they don't do that in a way that is consistent with how we as Muslims are required to believe in Allah, or they have elements where they have compromised their belief in Allah, like amulets and charms and things like that, then ultimately what's going to happen is that those words don't count for anything. Nothing at all. وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبَلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَتَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Allah told the Prophet ﷺ that if you had made a partner with Allah, we would have destroyed all of your deeds and you would be among the losers. And I think what's so profound about that ayah is that Allah said that to the Prophet ﷺ, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, that if you with all of the good, de- the good deeds that he has, if you cut it up into the number of people in this ummah, it, you, you know, it would be more than, than everyone in this ummah combined, what the Prophet ﷺ did. And yet Allah said, if you had made a partner with Allah in anything, we would have wiped out every single good that you did. We would have just wiped it out completely. And so that's why I think that a person's belief in Allah has to be the first thing that keeps you safe, right? So so on that point then, so just to pause on that point then, um, can we say then, because we're talking about the belief in Allah and understanding like the correct Aqidah, that a person who... Um, does, uh, for example, believe that wearing a specific necklace, an amulet, a ring, I've seen like, I think it's quite heavy, perhaps in my culture, like different colored rings, um, or even uh, you see people have, uh, I think what they call the hand of Fatima or like the, the blue like the blue eyes or something, um, yeah, the the, eye, yeah. they hang that up in the cars and their houses. So all of these things, right? Uh, can we say that the person there is not only going against what we're meant to actually believe, Right, but but even by having those things and seeking protection of those things, committing a major sin. Yeah, no doubt. And and a person even could get to the point of putting their religion at, at risk to the to the point where they 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 risk leaving the religion of Islam, depending on what they believe about those objects. Um, but because a person could get to the point where they start to believe those objects help them instead of Allah, even if that's a subconscious belief. It's not like a person says, yeah, I believe this helps me instead of Allah. But their actions indicate and the way they start to behave, they start to behave in a way that they believe that this benefits them instead of Allah. They could even leave the religion of Islam. So the situation is really, is so serious. And on the other side, but I want to say on a positive way, if we t- before we talk about the misconceptions and, and the, the, the wrong things. Fine. On the other side, if a person protects himself with the right belief, the right belief in Allah and the right, you know, sort of uh, the way you think of Allah and the way you, the things you believe about Allah, that can protect a person in a way that nothing else can protect a person. I can protect you in the akhirah when there is nothing to protect you. So for me, I think that to start with, you have to start by having the right belief in Allah. And I mean that comprehensively. I don't just mean... In, in one narrow part, but in all the aspects of how you believe in Allah, uh, Allah as your Lord, uh, believing in, in the worship of Allah alone and dedicating every single aspect of worship to Allah, Allah's names and attributes, how you think of Allah, or how you you know, put your trust and rely upon Allah, that, that whole comprehensive way that you believe in Allah, I think that is the most important thing in terms of your you know, being protected in in the sense that it's the biggest poss- it's the biggest thing that protects a person and not having it it can remove every other form of protection uh, and you know that's why we have a hadith which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam narrated from Allah in which he said that Allah said ana aghna shuraka an shirk man amila amalan ashraka fihi ma'i ghayri taraktuhu wa shirka i'm the least in need of anyone making a partner with me whoever does an action in which he associates others with me I leave him and his action, meaning the action becomes invalid. 
And so that is a major risk. The second major risk relates to the sunnah or major benefit, depending on which way you want to look at it, uh, relates to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you follow his sunnah, all of the barakah in your life comes from following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The more you follow it, the more likely it is that you're going to be protected and saved. And just to give one evidence for that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Let them take a warning. Those people who oppose the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Allah is going to cause a trial to happen to them. He's going to cause them to be put into a trial or a severe punishment. Now, by reverse understanding, what does that tell us? That if we follow his command, we'll be saved from trials and tribulations, and we're going to also be saved from punishments. So, again, another really common thing that people do, and I think it's going to be a theme of what we talk about today, is where people do things that is not that are not from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It's not what he did. It's not what he approved of. It's not what his companions did and learned from him and told us to do and showed us but something completely opposing that. And they believe that this is something that's going to get them nearer to Allah or is going to get them some kind of protection, when in fact it's going to remove the protection from them. And that's why we have, for example, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, in which she narrated that the Prophet said, Man amila amala laysa alayhi amruna rad. Whoever does an action that's not in accordance with what we have brought, it will be rejected. So again, the minimum loss you're getting when you go against the sunnah to try to protect yourself is the minimum that you can lose is that Allah will not make it, it will not be effective at all. And that's the minimum, that it will just it will not work. Fahuwa right. It's just not gonna, it's not gonna work. So not only does going against the sunnah not work, but it also takes you down the road route of uh, fitan, of trials, tribulations, afflictions, and also punishments in the hereafter. So that is from the, the worst of the major sins to, to add something or to practice something in this religion that didn't come from our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it wasn't practiced by his companions. So I feel that's another one that a lot of people don't maybe focus on as much as they should. Yeah, I suppose that also goes into what you mentioned on it, like the second podcast you did with us when Sam was, it was, it was you, uh, you, Sam and I, and you were saying that you got to be very conscious of who you take your religion from. Yeah, definitely. 100%. Uh, like Ibn Sirin said and others, This knowledge is your religion, so just be careful who you take your religion from. Because you end up doing things and... You know, a person really believes what they're doing is getting them so close to Allah and they really believe. I mean, people who wear, for example, sometimes amulets and things might have something from the Quran written on it. And that person believes with all their heart. They believe like 100 percent that this is this is protecting me. And, I'm, you know, that this is bringing me near to Allah and Allah is has inspired me to do this. And actually it's earning the anger of Allah. And it's bringing, you know, like the Prophet said, that it's لا يزيدك إلا وحنا. It's causing you to become weaker and more sick than you were before. So, subhanAllah, it, it, this is something people really need to think about. The third thing I really want to talk about, about protecting yourself is one hadith. And I think if, if people understood this hadith, it would change the way you see the idea of being protected. And it does overlap with what we've said, but it just adds a different dimension onto it. And the hadith is the hadith of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, Ya ghulam inni u'allimuka kalimat. He said, young man, I'm going to teach you some words. In other words, remember what I'm going to say to you. Ihfadillah yahfadik. Just those words alone. That if you guard what Allah commanded you to guard, Allah will guard you. If you protect what Allah commanded you to protect, Allah will protect you. So, I mean, these words are just, there, there are, you know, just three words. And those three words, to be honest, we could just, you could just cut those three words out of this clip and that would be enough for this whole episode. If you guard what Allah has told you to guard, Allah will guard you. So if you just look at what are the things that Allah has told us to guard, for example, Allah told us to guard our salah, right? Hafidhu ala salawati wa salatil wusta. Allah told us to guard our prayers. 
So when you guard your prayers and you take care of your prayers and you make sure that you pray in the right way, the right time, the right place, then Allah is going to protect you. And Allah promised it. You protect what Allah commanded you to protect and Allah will protect you. That's one thing. Allah told us to, to protect our private parts. Those people who protect their private parts. In other words, they're keeping themselves away from all kinds of... Not even. It's not just that they're not fornicating. They're keeping themselves away from anything which would lead to it. Anything which would even... A glance, a, a conversation, a message. They're keeping themselves. Well, I talk about this, you know, They're keeping themselves away from everything like that. And that person, when they're protecting that aspect of themselves, Allah has promised to protect them. And by reverse understanding, if they're not protecting that aspect of themselves, they're vulnerable to all kinds of problems, including the evil eye and all other kinds of issues. Because if they're not protecting what Allah told them to protect, then uh, they're putting themselves at risk. The, the lady who protects, the Muslim woman who protects her husband's house in his absence. She looks after her husband's house while he's away and she looks after his reputation and his honor. That she's looking after the, the, her husband's reputation, honor while her husband's not there. For example, that's from the things that Allah mentioned to protect. All of these different things. If you guard what Allah told you to guard, then Allah is going to keep you safe and Allah is going to protect you. So this is like what we talk about when we say al jazam in jins al-amal, that rewards come in the same kind of vein as the action that you did, the same type of thing as the action you did. You protected something for the sake of Allah and Allah protected you. And I just think that's, that is, that's really the summary of how you protect yourself in a comprehensive way. All the good deeds you do Keeping away from the sins. Allah told you to protect yourself from sin. To keep yourself away from sinning. And so every time you protect something that Allah told you to protect, Allah protects you. It's amazing because I came in this podcast with like, I suppose such a strong intention to focus on... Um, I suppose like the obvious, right? Like the 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 different adiyah, the adhkar and stuff like that. And then uh, and then when you explain that protection is so multifaceted, it's so it's from like all the way from what you from what you believe to how you behave. It's not just what you say or or, or even where your limbs go, but like starting from the belief uh, and uh, through and through like who you are as a person. Uh, it brings such a like completely different context to protection. Um, which is uh, it, it's powerful because like like I said, it's not something that I was expecting to kind of even discuss today. I was expecting to uh, for us to just like talk about the adhkar and like some examples, and then uh, talk about like the misconceptions. And to to hear such a, a a large like almost like introduction, like we haven't even even delved into the topic, and just like hear like an overall yeah. like idea that protection is is complete in kind of everything you do. It's it's so amazing. Um, it's it's sad that I'm um, I'm so that that we have like such a a, a a tight deadline today on this topic specifically because we've done podcasts together. I think that I've even gone like over two hours, and I think this is one of those ones that would like that justifies that amount of time. But being aware no, of the of... We, yeah, I think we can bring it. We can bring it to the to to. You see, the way I see it is, you know, the adkar that you spoke about, and I see it's like the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, it's, that's how I'm seeing it now. More, it's the most prominent thing. Like, they, don't get me wrong, I'm not taking anything away from that. The adhkar, this is how you are protected, by the permission of Allah. But as long as those adhkar are built on a foundation, which is under the water, you can't see it. You yeah. know, the thing, that, the thing that shows at the top is, is your adhkar. Wow. But underneath those adhkar, you have your belief in Allah, your following of the mm. sunnah, the way you behave, wow. the way you do your good deeds and keep away from sins. Though that's the the bulk of what's really protecting you, and it's kind of uh, personified by your adkar. Yeah, so I think that we're not leaving the adkar. No, 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 no. And I wasn't saying, and I wasn't yeah. saying that. But um, uh, okay, fine. So, so, so you're mentioning. Let, let's talk about the adkar then. Um, so I, I would love for uh, uh, perhaps to hear some examples of some like everyday um, 
like idea or the car that like are for um you know like we know about like um entering the bathroom or like uh, going into the uh, into your vehicle leaving the house coming into the house uh, eating your food so maybe like to hear i know some of that i know it sounds very like obvious but to, but i know a lot of these are very short so to hear maybe some examples of those but then also what i really want to also talk about is um the adhkar of the morning and evening something we hear about a lot but you know what is that and why is that so important um uh I, I, then we can go hopefully fit in a small bit of time for like some of those misconceptions as well yeah. we can inshallah so i think the first thing is um so let's let's talk about the adhkar let's divide the adhkar into into different types so adhkar are remembrances right like small sentences that you say uh during in, in certain situations uh, and some of them are general. You say them at all different times, like Alhamdulillah and La ilaha illallah. It's like unrestricted. You say it whenever you like. And some are restricted to particular situations or particular circumstances. And those particular situations and circumstances, many of them have a huge amount of protection. So, for example, if we look at some of the specific situations, let's just talk about leaving the house to start with. A person leaves the house and... You know, actually, we could talk about it. You know, even in a uh, in a different way, from from a person's day, from the from the time that they wake up in the morning. When you wake up in the morning, and and I think if I was to summarize this, I would definitely say everybody needs to have a copy of Fortress of the Muslim. Uh, Fortress of the Muslim, a very small book. You get it as an app. You get it as a PDF. You can get it on online as a part of a website. I mean, it's it's available in so many different languages. Very, very small book, which basically gives you all of these adhkar. But a person, let's just say a person wakes up in the morning. And from the minute they wake up in the morning, they remember Allah. Azawajal. And they get up, they go to, for example, when they're going to go into the bathroom. And they say, Bismillah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubuthi wal khaba'ith. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the male and female jinn. And we know that, that accord, yeah, inshallah, the, the stronger opinion is that the jinn can cause the evil eye as well. So that's, you know, that's another aspect. So that's, at the end of the day, that's a comprehensive, just a few words you say before you go in the bathroom. Just before you, you know, before you put, put your foot in the door. But while you're standing at the edge of the door before you go into the bathroom, and you go in with your left foot and you say those words. And Allah protects you from anything related to the jinn and the shayateen in the bathroom. And I've seen people do all sorts of weird and wonderful things to protect themselves in the bathroom and you know people who i mean to the point like there's people who who you know for example shower fully clothed because they're frightened mm -hmm. of what the the jinn and the shayateen will look at them or, you know simple words will save you from a lot of a lot of hassle and a lot of uh, difficulty then a person for example you know when they're getting ready they remember allah they're gonna go out of the house and they say bismillah Tawakkaltu ala Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. In the name of Allah, I rely, I put my reliance upon Allah, I rely upon Allah. And there is no ability to change anything, and there is no power to do anything except with Allah. And we said that the, the reward for this one is that it is said to the person that you have been guided, khudita, and you have been protected, wa wukita, wa kufita. And you have been sufficed against everything. So nothing bad can happen to you. Really simple. Even going into the house, there's not an authentic dua as such for going into the house except Bismillah and just giving the salam. Bismillah and giving, you know, uh, salamu alaikum. This is from the, the, the dua. There is a, there's a dua for entering the house that Bismillah wa lajna wa Bismillah kharajna. This uh, dua is not authentic. But just saying Bismillah and giving salam to people when you enter the house That's one thing When you eat You say Bismillah When you say Bismillah When you enter the house And Bismillah when you eat The shaitan is prohibited From uh, Residing in your house And the shaitan is prohibited From eating with you So they don't They don't have a place to eat And they don't have a place to say Just Bismillah I means it's, it's a single word It's a simple religion Isn't it Sheikh? It's very very simple Subhanallah Very simple indeed And if a person For example they go and they pray Fajr. And they pray Fajr in the Jama'ah because that's one of the things that Allah told us to protect, right? Especially for the men. For the women, there's a choice. If they want to go to the masjid, the Prophet said, don't stop them. And he said, And their houses are better for them. So it's they have a choice. But for the men 
who go to the masjid and they pray in the jama'ah, the Prophet said, This person is under Allah's protection until the evening comes. And Allah's, Allah has given them a guarantee of protection until the evening comes, just for praying fajr with the congregation. Then a person sits after fajr and they remember Allah with what we call the adhkar as-sabah, the remembrances of the morning. And again, you know, easiest thing is, you know, fortress of the Muslim, open a copy and, uh, you know, subhanAllah, just go to the section that says remembrances for the morning and the evening. And there are so many. But if we just look at, you know, for example, let's just look at one really sh short one and really simple one. Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis sama wa huwa samir alim. And we say it three times. Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis sama wa huwa samir alim. Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis sama wa huwa samir alim. In the name of Allah, the one with whose name nothing is harmed in the heavens or the earth. And he is the all hearing, the all knowing. Or we look at the dua. Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith, aslih li sha'ni kulla, wala takilni ila nafsi tarfata'in. That, O Al Hay Al Qayyum, the ever living and the sustainer of all that exists, it is your mercy that I seek, uh, I seek protection or I seek help through your mercy. Correct all of my affairs for me. And don't leave me to myself for the blink of an eye. I imagine that if, if you, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't leave you for the blink of an eye. You are protected all the time. Ayatul Kursi. Ayatul Kursi is a protection from the shaitan. And you read it after every prayer. For example, after Fajr, after Dhuhr, after Asr, Maghrib, Isha. After every Fard prayer, you read Ayatul Kursi. And you're protected from that prayer until the next prayer by the, the greatest ayah in the Quran and Allah gives you, Allah helps you and protects you through your recitation of the greatest ayah in the Quran you know just the, the, the three quls maybe some people ayat al kursi is they're still learning, it's something definitely to learn if you haven't learnt it this Ramadan for people who don't know it, it's definitely something that you should be should try to learn but the three quls قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ one time after every Fard prayer, three times after Fajr, three times after Maghrib. Really, really simple. And yet a person is protected from every single thing. Everything. And this, the, the, the three quls protect you against every single kind of evil. There's nothing bad that can happen to you. Uh, you're protected by it. So after it's Fajr just, and after Maghrib. After Fajr and after Maghrib, yeah. To be there's a there's a long discussion and you know in fact if someone looks back to my videos they're gonna say I'm sure you said after Asr and it, there's a long discussion about whether it's after Asr or after Maghrib uh, I just kept it simple for this discussion I kept it after right. Maghrib to be honest um, but yeah uh, three times after Fajr three times after Maghrib such simple things and you know sometimes when people look through the morning and evening adhkar they see that the morning and evening adhkar are really long. Uh, and they maybe see, well, oh, you know, there's 10 pages here. I don't have time. But you can even just, you know, just select the odd, you know, one or two. For example, uh, one of the things that I would never, ever leave is Sayyidul Istighfar, which is the dua of the, the best dua for forgiveness that you make. And it's once in the morning, once in the evening. So once after Fajr, once after, after Maghrib. And you say, Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant khalaqtani wa ana abduk wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'adika ma istata'at a'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'at abu'u laka bi ni'matika alay wa abu'u bi dhanbi faghfir li fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa ant and this is the greatest dua of istighfar that oh Allah you are my lord and there is no god worthy of worship but you you created me and I am your servant and I am following your commands and your covenant as much as I can and then you say that, oh Allah, I confess to you the blessings that you gave to me and I confess my sins. So forgive me because no one forgives sins except you. And this is a dua that there is no sin you can do except it is forgiven with this dua. It's wow. the greatest of all of the duas of forgiveness. And you just in the morning, in the evening, and we said your sins are a reason to be affected, right? I mean, we're not, we haven't even gone off the topic of the evil eye. Like, your sins are a reason for your protection to be low. 
And I think if I just, just to give you an idea of that, like Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, he, he said the evil eye is an arrow which comes from the soul of the one who envies and the one who puts the evil eye upon the other. Towards the one who is envied and the one that evil eye is put upon. Sometimes it hits and sometimes it misses. If the target is exposed and unprotected, it will certainly affect him. But if the target is cautious and armed, the arrow will have no effect and may even come back upon the person who launched it. It's exactly like shooting real arrows. One is shooting at the souls and the ruh and the other one is shooting at bodies and limbs. That's just the way that, you know, if you can get, if you get forgiveness in the morning, that's got to be one of the most powerful pieces of armor that you can wear over the course of the day to stop you getting shot. I mean, you, you just imagine it's a battlefield. The evil eye out there, especially, I mean, there are a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrated that the, that the majority of the people of this ummah will die from the evil eye. Yeah, I actually want to ask you is, about that. Yeah, the hadith is authentic. I mean, there is the hadith, I think, if we take all of the hadith on that topic, we can say that it reaches the level of being fair, even though the individual hadith have some weakness in it. But okay. if we take all of the hadith together on that topic, uh, there are there is a hadith uh, that it's astonishing, the majority isn't it? of the people. It's Just astonishing. It yeah, like there's, yeah, it's crazy when you think of it like that. It just makes and you want to be protected. The thing is, yeah, and there are see there are a couple of different hadith. There's the hadith of Jabir that the Prophet said, "أكثر من يموت من أمتي بعد قضاء الله وقدره بالأنفس يعني بالعين." That the most most of the people who will die from my nation after the decree of Allah. And meaning after the decree of Allah, meaning that we don't deny the decree of Allah. And affirming, while affirming the decree of Allah, most of the people will die from the evil eye. And that hadith has a weakness in it. But when you put it together, there are other hadith as well. There's a hadith that the evil eye will put a man into his grave and we'll put a camel into the cooking pot. So this all goes together with the ahadith al ayn haq the evil eye is real, and so on. It's very profound, but to, if you think, you know, it's a battlefield, you're getting shot at from yeah, all, so. you, you, you walk outside the house, there's people shooting at you, but it's just invisible bullets, you can't so. see them. And so for you to have the forgiveness of Allah, and to have been forgiven for your sins in the morning, forgiven for your sins in the evening, protected on these different layers, you know, so many different ways you've been protected by all of these different adhkar and du'as and your, you know, your belief and the way that you act and the way, and you walk out there and you are fully protected against all of those people who are shooting those arrows of jealousy and animosity towards you. It's uh, it's just, uh, I could listen all day, Sheikh. It's just so uh, interesting, but also more than interesting, it's like, you know, um, so fundamental for us to know these things is, is like the basis of so we can like protect ourselves um let's talk there's about let's, actually bef fine. before we go on to that topic sorry to interrupt you because there's nah, a, no, i know no. we're gonna i know i know we're going after this but I, before yeah. we go there there is the also don't forget the adhkar before you go to sleep a lot of oh, people yeah. you know talk about yeah before you go to sleep a lot of people talk about you know kids having nightmares and you know people not sleeping well just do your adhkar before you go. open fortress of the Muslim. And look at, you know, for example, reading Ayatul Kursi, reading the three quls and, you know, blowing into your hand and wiping over yourself. Uh, you know, these are the, Shif, some of the things that Do you do that, that process? Do you do that process three times? Or do you read the three quls three times and then blow in, in your uh, hands and do that once? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, first of all, you. I think that the, the there's many, the, the way the narrations are, but you blow into your hands first. That's the most common narration. You blow into your hands first, and then you read. And I, I think you do the process three times. From what I've understood from it, is that you repeat that entire process of the blowing, the reading of the of al ikhlas al falaq and nas, and the wiping, and you repeat it. You repeat it three times, and Allah knows best. Maybe it needs a little bit of, of research into it. You mentioned children, and that's a massively popular um, question that's always being raised. Like, how do we protect our children? Um, uh, do we do adhkar for them? Do we blow on them? You see, people after salah, they uh, after they done the adhkar, they then like blow on their children and stuff like that. What do we know about adhkar of the children or, or protecting our children? So I'm just thinking there's one really, really powerful. Uh, Dhikr or dua that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make for Al-Hassan Hussein. 
Now, I think what's powerful about this is, first of all, the Prophet Sallallahu used to do it. And he used to do it for Al-Hassan and Hussein. And I mean, you know, they are the best children, right? They, they, they were the best example of, of children and they're the, the leaders of the, the young people of Jannah. So, you know, the amount of jealousy and the amount of, of you know, animosity there must have been towards them. And yet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to repel it with, with this dua. He used to say, أُعِيذُكُمْ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَّةِ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْطَانٍ وَهَامَّةِ وَمِنْ كُلِّ عَيْنٍ لَامَّةِ I seek Allah's protection for you from every shaitan and every beast and every envious eye. And that's just, you know, everything is there. Um, I do think that you, you can read adhkar for your children to teach them. But I don't think there's any evidence for reading adhkar over your children other than that dua. That dua, yes, you can read it over your kids. What about reading Falaq al-Nas? Did the Prophet sallallahu I, I, I think I once heard about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, reading Falaq al-Nas uh, for Hassan and Hussein. I might be wrong there. Perhaps it's something that I need to look at. I don't know. I, I remember him reading it over his family generally. So it's quite Fine. possible. I remember okay. he, he would read it over his family, especially if they became unwell. So I, I think that's like within the realm of what a person can do. But generally speaking, a person just needs to what a person really needs to do is just to to teach their children all the things that we've been talking about. So as a baby, definitely just, you know, to read over them uh, the, the dua that we mentioned. Uh, and then as they get older, just to 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 teach them the ha- those habits, the habits of protecting themselves and the adhkar and the dua and those all the things that we've spoken about in this episode so far. So I think we need to. We have to have that five minutes for this uh, yeah. talking about misconceptions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so, so misconception. So um, there's so many different ways that people um, try and seek their protection. We discussed it throughout the episode, to be honest. So it's it's not like it needs like too long of a discussion. And I think we all get the gist of where you what you're um, going to say about it to an extent. But um, amulets, bracelets. Um, uh, there's the like we said the eye. E- even your thoughts on 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 when people have stuff like, for example, they, uh, like you mentioned, the people write mash, uh, mashallah on the walls or on their they like I've seen people like stick it on their cars, um, or like even I've seen like um, YouTube videos where like someone will have like a mashallah like constantly like um, back and forth like uh-huh. on the screen and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and um, there was a there was one last thing. Um, he, he, uh, one thing I've seen, Sheikh, that, that that will probably surprise you now is that there's an emoji for that blue evil eye thing. It is an emoji that exists, and people now mm. uh, in their Instagram profiles, their social media profiles, they'll have the emoji, or even they'll upload a picture uh, of uh, whether it's themselves or, or, or like something like their car or something. And after they've written their caption, they'll post that emoji. And uh, one can only assume that the reason they're posting that emoji is to you know, quote unquote, try and protect themselves from the evil eye. So, yeah, you, just your thoughts on all of that and the seriousness of it. Yeah, it's very, very serious, and it's completely forbidden in Islam. This uh, idea of this, um, the hand of Fatima, or this blue eye that is most commonly uh, associated with. It's kind of a you see it a lot in Turkey and places yeah. like that, but it's been kind of adapted all over the world. Uh, people tie a black cloth to things. Uh, people, you know, the, all of this. To be honest. It is so easy for a person to fall into making a partner with Allah because none of this is anything that Allah has permitted us to protect ourselves with. And if a person starts to believe that this protects them instead of Allah, then you know the situation is is really as serious as it can be in terms of their iman, in terms of their Islam, is extremely, extremely serious. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned man alaqa tamimatan faqad ashraq. Whoever ties a amulet has committed polytheism, has made a partner with Allah. The matter is so, so serious. And if the scholars, they differed over and they had this harsh discussion over the one who ties the Quran, the one who ties the the, the ayah, an ayah from the Quran, and the correct opinion is that it's not allowed to tie an ayah from the Quran for protection, then how about the one who's putting an eye who's put in a hand, uh, let's even say that it is the hand of Fatima, which has no relation to Fatima at all, radiallahu anha. But even if we say that it is, 
this is asking is this asking Fatima for protection now? Have we got to the state where of making a partner with Allah that we started asking the Sahabiyat for protection instead of Allah? This is something which is hugely, hugely serious. So I would divide it into two very briefly. One, things that constitute making a partner with Allah. And the second would be the things which are prohibited in Islam and are, are like things that were newly introduced that were not known by the Prophet and the Sahaba. So I think there are two things in that category that I would like to highlight. Number one is tying the Quran or writing the Quran for protection. So in terms of like tying the Quran around your neck or keeping uh, an amulet with the Quran inside, that is not something the Prophet Sallallahu did and it's not something the Sahaba did radiallahu anhum. And so it's not something we should do. And likewise, this idea of writing things like, you know, writing Masha'Allah for protection. Again, I don't see that, again, that the Prophet Sallallahu instructed this or that he, I mean, I can understand someone encouraging someone to say it like writing in a caption, say MashaAllah. That I can understand. But, you know, the idea that by writing MashaAllah on something, I don't think this is from the Sunnah. But the most serious and the ones that are, you know, absolutely, you know, so serious are the things that are not related to the Quran, but like are, you know, often from, they came from other cultures. It came from Hinduism and Christianity and, uh, you know, the the Majus, the people who worship the, the two gods of light and dark and, all of them have these different things to protect from the evil eye and they've been kind of adapted into Islam like this hand of Fatima and the uh, the blue eye that people put on things and tie in a black cloth around things and and so on. It's just so serious and it's it's not just that it's serious because it puts your religion at risk but it's also serious because it doesn't work. Uh, and like the Prophet ﷺ said when he saw a man who tied a black, uh, tied a string, not a black string, just tied a string to his hand he said, what is this? The man said, this is to stop weakness happening to me. It's to, it's to stop me from being affected by sickness. The Prophet said, cut it off because it's just going to make you more sick. It's going to make you weaker than you were, than you were before. So we, we just have to not tie things and put things like that and these you know, eyes and stuff like that. We just got to keep completely away from all of that stuff. And also keep away from the things that even though they have and a basis in Islam, but they're not. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ did. Like writing the Quran, putting the Quran on things to protect it, and, and things like that. Sheikh, just before we go, I, I just remembered one thing and, uh, that um, I wanted to ask you about. It was the um, like if you fear that somebody has given you, or say if somebody, if you, you something you've been afflicted with something, and then somebody like your Muslim brother says, "Oh, you know what? I actually, um, I remember one time, you know, I I said like for example, a person he's uh, struggling with uh, 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 with worse of um, like." Um, of Tahara, for example, keeping clean, right? And um, yeah. and then his Muslim brother says, Subhanallah, you know what? I remember maybe like a, a year ago, I remember saying like, I just like, in, you know, I didn't mean anything evil by it, but I remember saying like, oh, like, uh, mashallah, that brother, you know, he can really hold his wudu for a long time. So like, you know, the, and, he, and so you kind of know that perhaps that, that could have affected you and stuff. And I've heard about this, like kind of making wudu in the bath water. I kind of wanted to quickly go over, uh, I don't know too much about it. So what's, how does that work? And, and how would someone practically do that if you did maybe have an idea of who gave you evil eye? Yeah, so the treatment for the evil eye is really simple. It's just divided into two. Either you know the person or suspect them, or either you have no idea who did it. If you know the person or suspect them, then the treatment is to go to them and to ask them to make wudu or to bathe. And the way you would do this just in a simple way is make, for example, stand in a, in a bathtub and put the plug in and just to make wudu and maybe bathe themselves briefly. And th the water is then collected into a jug. And then what it's done is it's poured over the person who... Uh, was afflicted by the evil eye. Over and if someone head. asks you, yeah, over the back of their head in the hadith of Sahar ibn Hanif, okay. over the back of their head, or over the place where they've been afflicted. If they've been afflicted, let's say, in the whole body, then you can, from the back of the head or on the whole body, if it's they've been afflicted in their hair or something, you could put it into their hair. But this brings us to a very important hadith that the Prophet said, If anyone asks you to bathe, you have to bathe. If someone comes to you and says that I think you gave me the evil eye, it is obligatory on you that you must make wudu oh, really? or bathe for that person. It's not for you to say that oh, it wasn't me. You you know why you're accusing me for? I didn't do it. That's when you know who did it. 
What about when you don't know who did it? Then here the Prophet said, Would you not have made Ruqya or sought Ruqya? So Ruqya Shari'ah is the cure for the evil eye if you don't know who has given it. Like for example, there was a, a narration about the children of Ja'far. The Prophet said, why do I see the children of Ja'far? Why do I see them weak? I said, they look weak. And in another narration, he heard a child that was crying all the time. And it was said that they're weak because of the evil eye. Like they're, they're not putting on weight because they, they're badly, they're, they're susceptible to getting affected by the evil eye. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Why don't you ask Ruqya for them? Or why don't you recite Ruqya for them? So that's for when you don't know who gave the evil eye. Or you just see the person, it just looks like they're afflicted by the evil eye. Then, you know, Ruqya is a good way to go. And maybe you could post a link to like, for example, just the seven day program is a quick idea or quick solution yeah, for sure. that problem inshallah Jazakallah khair Sheikh. Thank you so much for uh, giving me your time as always. Please oh, yeah, just stay there uh, for a second. Uh, guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Freshly Grounded. Uh, thank you so much uh, to uh, Sheikh Mohammed Tim Humble. Always very generous with his time for us. Uh, and so very much so appreciated. Uh, and we'll see you inshallah next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam.